Good afternoon and most welcome to H806. Yes, I remember the number without looking at the whiteboard. And how come can that be? Well, it has to do with skills. And one skill I've taken up recently is memorizing skills. My memory has improved. Uh, by constant repetition of different things and see if I can keep in my mind something for an extended period. My memory used to be really, really bad. Uh, I had to write everything down on a piece of papers and on top of it I usually forgot to read the papers. And I even remember like six or seven years came this app Everything is about app these days. An app on the mobile, and that app would remind you. So it was ringing and telling me to take my medication, run an errand, or uh, send in a form, uh, make phone calls. The only thing, when uh, after a while many alarms sounded, I ignore them. Uh, I don't have time now, I was thinking. And all of a sudden the whole system collapsed and I think you cannot sort of so to speak delegate memory to outside yourself in the end even if those things like the app are very helpful in the beginning in the end you are yourself responsible and I also remember uh, I had a conversation with a much younger person who was uh, the secretary of my dentist and she said she didn't remember anything and I recommended the app and she said exactly the same thing. Well, I don't remember anymore to look at the app when it sounds the alarm. I, I know it's something I need to do but I don't bother to check it. Well, uh, in that case I understood I am myself responsible for what I remember. But there are some problems here. It's not that easy to start and uh, I think one of the reasons is the divide we made. Uh, the other day I talked about we make a division so that actually construe a complete body and a complete mind. In that case I was talking about the body. By making a division, oddly enough, the body becomes whole and complete. And we ignore divisions that should be made in the body. We have two completely different areas. They're not similar in any way. Um, the skin is different. Uh, the senses are different. They go into different patterns within the neural system. We need to make a difference. Now, we are instead looking at the mind. And once again, the division creates a whole mind. And I have to admit, the whole mind is even more difficult to get rid of than the idea of a whole body. The whole body, you see proof, you can feel it, you see the difference, you feel the difference. And you feel much better once you're starting to make the division, as I do now when talking reminded but actually the mind is divided too and should be divided there are actually completely different minds within the mind and this has been something that we know for quite a while it's not a complete news to neurology or the cognitive sciences it's been going around for a while uh, there was a bestseller already in the 80s, maybe early 90s, uh, that uh, discussed the different cells. Uh, I don't remember the title, title, but it was translated to at least 30 languages. It was like popular uh, fiction at that time, um, no, popular fact book. Uh, but there is a division and uh, the division is quite big. We need to separate areas, otherwise we get to mumble. And uh, we, 
just stepped into the area we started to talk about the prefrontal lobes and that they have a specific task to uh, partake in every time we do something and they only do that they say yes and they say no to different actions the actions are stored elsewhere and just by not us understanding that working process I think most people actually think the brain is a whole thing and it does its own job and that's very very far from the point the body needs to be trained maybe if you go to a gym different muscular groups by different muscular groups the same goes for the mind and I think we used to understand that because we used to have, at least uh, when it comes to apprenticeship, different periods where you learn different skills. It wasn't a mumble jumble. But today, this division has taken its toll. It is the, nothing short than our rationality. It's the tool we make our decisions with, and it's also the tool we decide what should we do in education, what is knowledge and such stuff. Let me just mention a few of the skills that we have identified these days. We have something called sustained attention and that is usually something that has to do with the neocortex, it's this area. And uh, it means that for instance, you are fixing a tire, you can put 10 minutes only working with the tires. Uh, your thinking doesn't go anywhere else in that period. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't answer the phone or you can answer a question if somebody turns around. But the important thing is that you can keep your attention on it. And that's called sustained attention. It's very important. It has to do with the neocortex. Uh, if the skill is weak, I'm just going to mention that so it would be easy to identify. Uh, there will be uh, loads of unfinished projects and you'll be jumping from task to task. And that takes a lot of time, but I am today not talking about how effective it is, I'm just talking about the mind, that these skills need to be there, not for its purpose, but mentioning the purpose could actually be a pointer to understand what the skill is. Then we have something called selective attention. Selective attention is further back on the neocortex, and if you have a heavy blow on that place, you can lose your selective attention for a while, even an uh, extended period. Uh, I had uh, myself a uh, severe concussion, uh, must have been 30 years ago, uh, when I had a crash with the, uh, with the car. I was on the bike. Of course, I landed on my head. And uh, maybe a whole year after that, I had a problem, problem with selective attention. And it means that I cannot I could not focus my attention on one thing solely. And it's not sustained, it's more that you put your whole focus on one thing. If you want to put the thread for a needle, for the eye of the needle, you need selective attention. All your attention should go there. In that case, you should not answer the phone. You should not talk to somebody else. And even more important, other thoughts should not pop up. And I would say the other thoughts are the greatest problem. Uh, I mentioned before that we have a gazillion action thoughts constantly going on in our system. It's further back here and they are poking on their uh, attention. They want to be performed. They want to be made. And uh, selective attention, that also means that you have the ability to say no to those. Uh, when you say no to those, you can have only one in the end, or two, 
for three, but you need to make them fewer. <clears throat> then we have memory. There is something called long-term memory. If uh, somebody tells me uh, today that uh, Bishop was uh, put out of office, that happened yesterday, I will remember that for about two to three days. But if I don't put that into my long-term memory, that will be gone within a week or two. Uh, long-term memory needs for it to be established, be repeated at least four times. The first time within 24 hours, the second time within two days, the third time within three to four days, and the fourth time within a week. And I'm not going to do that with a bishop, so he's going to... <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes. I have to be honest. <laughs> uh, so that will not be included in my long-term memory. Very few people in the Western culture know you have to do it this specific way. Otherwise, it will not end in the long-term memory. So if you don't understand that, you just, you're just being lucky. Things that may be caught catches your interest, will stay in your memory. If possibly, if I was related to this bishop, I would mention him within one day, two days, three days. Obviously I would, to tell <laughs> gossip. Uh, <laughs> examples of this uh, lack of this skill is, of course, exactly at an example, forgetting names. Uh, his name was Thomas something. That's what I remember now. Well, because I haven't intentionally trained that. But it could also be that you do poorly on tests uh, and uh, you forget things you used to know. And now I'm not talking about this app thing, that's short-term memory, but you forget whole skills. Uh, for instance, you forget how to repair a bike or something like that. Or poach an egg. Then you have working memory or short-term memory and this does enable you to hang on to information while in the process of using it so while i'm reading this paper i need to remember what i just read and that is going to be put into the uh, short-term memory or for instance i have a whole manual how to understand that watch I must be able to memorize each part. How do I open it? I use a screwdriver at the back, then I use a knife. Uh, otherwise, I had to go constantly back to the papers. And uh, that's just an example. Usually, you don't have papers. You need to know short-term memory. You need to be able to do these things. And then uh, I have an example, just logic and reasoning. And uh, one, this is a part of logic. It's an even greater part of logic to understand this could be made otherwise and doesn't have to be made in exactly this way all the time. And that's something you uh, sort of learn when you are being really young, but it can actually be improved. And that part of our uh, ability is stored in different parts of everything except the prefrontal cortex, all this way. Yeah. And here it's very interesting. We have something most people don't know anything about, and that's auditory processing. And this enables you to analyze, blend and segment sound. If you have problems with this skill, it will be problematic for you to understand written text in a fluent way. Because even if I read, even if now I read it out loud, even if I read it silent in my head, I need to differentiate between the different sounds. Sounds odd, but we know that's how it works. And if I'm weak at that, my fluency in reading and understanding will be lower. And especially auditory processing, it's 
completely dependent how much you had trained and also a second thing how much you train that on a weekly basis as well so it's a training you do over years but it's also something you repeat every week there it has to be at least one to two hours of eating every week and uh, that's not a lot but there are actually people who don't read that much either uh, because newspaper are disappearing there's a lot of videos on the internet you can watch tv and then you don't actually read and it's just more than enough for one to two hours a week uh, another thing is visual processing something i train myself because i was painting and it enables you to think in visual images and that is incredibly important this is an area that has been more or less forgotten as an area uh, we don't remember the shapes of the words for instance here we have actually an excellent example because i can't read this but what i could presumably do is remember the shape of the words here or uh, the graphic figuration and it used to be the case that people could remember exactly how something was written and by doing so they can remember large amount of text without understanding it and actually and this is odd the thing is you can remember much more text by that uh, variety and there is a thing called speed reading i just mentioned this to make it more clear what it's about speed reading i've seen that in action it's like looking at the page taking it away looking at the page taking it away looking at the page taking it away and that you do with your visual skill and what happens you process the pages later not when you read because visual skills as i talked about uh, are different from auditory processing it's much quicker and uh, speed readers do that a lot people who are working with shorthand stenography it's called in swedish and uh, they also use that and actually a good judge uh, uh, shorthand writer or stenographer they can actually just look at a whole page of stenography and a whole page of stenography is the equivalence of four to five pages and they can remember it and they can copy it and uh, oddly enough it doesn't seem to be any limit to visual processing uh, and that's why we got the term uh, photographic memory we long time thought that photographic memory is connected to this as well uh, it's almost like a camera so that person can look at this and he can walk away and copy it exactly but it turned out that photographic memory is actually often a learned skill and everyone can actually learn photographic memory uh, it's odd yeah uh, we have a swedish guy called matthias ribbing he had a well he was bad at all these things uh, he, he was as he said himself almost an hdhd person or the hoarder person he didn't remember anything he didn't have any tension he didn't have long-term memory he didn't even have short-term memory but for some reason he started to train all those skills almost all at once and probably because it progressed so quick in the beginning sometimes it is like that it's unusual but sometimes that's the case he got incredibly interested in this memory training he just got better and better and better and in the end he won the world champion in memory and he was memorizing things it's just beyond belief so he went from a person having mm, loads less than average memory to be the best one in the world his name is Matthias Ribbing and uh, last time I checked three years ago he written like four or five books about how to train your memory 
both internationally published and some also in Swedish. It's, the whole thing is extraordinarily interesting. But these skills needs, definitely needs to be trained separately, not in a club. And you see here, this is what we're doing. We clump everything together. There is no definition, there is no clarity. It's a complete jumble bumble, or as we say in Swedish, pytti panna. Pytti panna doesn't help anyone. And uh, my first encounter with people having another opinion was long before I started to study these subjects. And it was actually in China, and I learned a term called or by wu. And or by wu, it means at some cases a person who only can separate three different skills, or a few, it's the actual term, a few skills, but something like three, only three. And or by wu is completely incompetent. That person is deemed completely incompetent, uh, almost non functional. And uh, when we went to China, we were all called as a group or by wooers, like we were completely incompetent. And well, I was a student at that case, but we were a professor as well. Professor as the old title. That means that you were head of an institution. Eight of them. And they were all called R by Wu. Especially my old professor, uh, who didn't manage any other skill than this jumble bumble he had. He couldn't even learn the tonal system of the Chinese. Instead, he raised his eyebrows. And once we pointed that out to him, it didn't make any difference at all. He continued to raise his eyeball when he wanted to say something with a high tone, like woo instead of woo. It's amazing. Uh, this trait in uh, the Western culture, which has gone haywire since we let everything be ruled by the ratio or rationality, it's almost the same thing as jumping or clogging people together and naming them something and think that you actually learn something. And by calling all these people Malarmé, Voltaire, Napoleon, Pascal, Giscard d'Estaing, if we call these old people French and we say that's it, I don't know anything else about these people. I don't want to know it enough to say that they are French. This is actually what we are doing. And you even have the audacity to say that you know something, that you have uh, some sort of uh, information there. You don't. Obviously, they're French. You need to know that they are different, in what way they are different, maybe even their different pay time periods, and you can get deeper and deeper and deeper and you do that by having different skills for instance there is an obvious visual traits to this they look different and it could be the visual could be both the person a depiction of him it could also be the book or something they done something that's connected to them it could be a town it could be all those things that are visual and then you have long time memory. In which connection did you last time hear them? That's a very significant clue because it might not tell you exactly what the person is. But if you heard Napoleon in some historic connection or a guided tour, somebody pointing at a house or something, you know somewhere in the vicinity. And that's usually enough. This is just an example. Think about reality. You walking around doing things, then you need to separate these things and you need to use your old time experience. And you need to go into those experiences and do the separation, visual, auditory, long-term memory, short-term memory, attention-wise, and so forth and so forth. There is a deepening of the whole thing. It's not as shallow as we think. We just flump them all together. And uh, I think we call those, all those things for knowledge. 
And instead of seeing knowledge as different skills, we put them in different subjects. And we all say that they are affected by the same knowledge, capability. It's, it's a little bit like going down to the sports uh, arena and say, I'm very good at sports. And there is like 10 different sports going on. And which, which sport are you good in? And just good? What do you mean? I'm good in sports. Why well, you, you can play badminton and you can't do it because your general skill doesn't mean anything. A general skill doesn't have any saying in the brain because the brain is incredibly separated is actually built to be separated. Just as we mentioned before, the separation between left hemisphere and right hemisphere is just incredible. And it's much more separated in human beings than in our cousins, uh, the apes. Even more so uh, than we see in the monkeys, even more so than we see in the general mammal. And the further you go from human beings, the less specialization you find in the different hemisphere. There's always a division, but it's more in human beings. And actually to be human being is to make those separations. It's an understanding of reality. And lumping all knowledge together like that without level, because they are historically different and a different importance as well. That's something you shouldn't re regret. One of these characters is completely unimportant. Who's that? Um, the one that they pointed at. Yes. And that's the conclusion Callum makes for not having heard him before, or maybe heard him in some, uh, some area. And obviously, he's completely unimportant. You never have to mention his name ever again. And you can make that conclusion different ways. I never heard about him. I can make the conclusion because you have a general basis of knowing the area. And then you can make that conclusion. That's a specific visual thinking skill. It's called exclusion. You exclude him. Like this. And actually a part of the divide. So you use your visual thing. Uh, to make an exclusion and uh, I mentioned before and I just mentioned her over and over again I hope she watches our video sometime Barbara Tversky but she also showed that it was a visual skill to do the basic uh, uh, skills for rationality and uh, one is decontextualization one is recontextualization and so forth this is a decontextualization you decontextualize him, the other ones are more or less very important. He is not important at all. So, yeah, and as usual, we do the division in the wrong place. Uh, here we call different subject, and you can say, well, I'm not very good with history, but I'm really good with languages. That's also problematic things because your brain doesn't know the difference. And sure as hell, reality doesn't know that difference either. The divisions are other, and uh, we are just starting to learn them. Uh, in Asia, you have a minimum of 14 different skills to be trained. They are recognized with different words. Everybody know when they are in different areas of the brain. And uh, that is similar, it's parallel to the uh, interesting things that Ian McGilchrist presented. And it's not that we should get rid of the left hemisphere. It is that we should know when we are using it, so we not use it in the wrong place. And uh, one instance is we should not use the left hemisphere when we want to know uh, the whole thing. Or we should not use it when we try to feel ourselves where we are in reality. There are a working division. And this working division is incredibly important for the working of the brain. Because we have more divisions than any living animal on this planet. Here we come into incredibly interesting stuff, something called processing speed. And this is the speed 
that your brain, so to speak, can process information. And that is a global skill. It's all over the head, except for the frontal lobes. And that is something that is solely trained. You cannot be born with it. It is something that's trained because it's trained later in life. And it's plastic. It's completely plastic. It's dependent how much you trained it before and how much you do it on a weekly basis. These things are usually on a weekly basis. Uh, you need to get uh, some sort of competence and then you can, uh, um, once you know the difference between processing speed, how you train that specific area. That's very close to a gym actually. If you go to a gym, you do your bike caps in one place, you do your tree caps this way, you do your legs this way and similar. You don't have one singular machine if you go into the gym, if it's a good gym. If it's a Norwegian gym, it's maybe only one thing. <laughs> and we could actually say our current educational system is a Norwegian gym. It's one thing for the whole shit. And everybody, everything goes into the same bucket. It's just awful. But uh, the good thing, uh, usually there is no permanent damage done to the brain. And since we uh, talked about uh, the plasticity of the brain. It's just amazing. Um, here is another thing. This is something called visual closure. Uh, and that's the ability to visualize a complete whole. But you can do it also when you get incomplete visual information or a partial picture. This is one of those skills we don't train at all. Nothing. There's absolutely zero. The only way to train that, which is extremely important when it comes to this type of thinking, making conclusions, making analysis, uh, recognizing it, what information is, even if it's termed differently, uh, recognizing different levels of information, because all those things is partial. This is partial. It's not the whole information. Uh, to be complete, it would have been pages and pages. Who's Napoleon? Who's Voltaire? And who is that fellow she's got to stand? Uh, that's not possible in reality. So visual closure is one of those things that are ex exceedingly important. How do you train it? Well, I can give an example. I've been trying to train it a couple of years ago, but the best way to train that is, uh, for instance, in Chinese, you have this system of cursivity. It looks a little bit like that. It gets more and more cursive. And in the end, you have very, very little information. It's completely partial. That's the best way to train it. And oddly enough, this is how we used to train it in the West. We used to have handwriting training in school and people got used to read different handwritings. Most of what was written in those times were handwritten. It wasn't printed or anything like that. This is how we train visual closure. And because of rationality, we didn't find any use for that. And we used this absurdity to tell this is unclear, why keep that, let's print things. Or, as uh, I think two years after I was schooled, I still had to learn this, uh, like writing like this. Something like this. The, school, the school year after, they started to do like this, because it was clearer. We need to train on clarity, otherwise we can't do this analyzing and information skills. Otherwise, we don't know how to train those skills. It's vastly important. The world is not out there to come into my head all of a sudden. You can't do any of this without visual closure. It's exceedingly important. And we took that away. Good thing it could be trained without a doubt. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. It's, uh, 
and in, in the East they try they train this for years and years. Every day they get receive a letter, even to this day they write letters. And uh, if you don't get trained in visual closures with those letters, you, you never get it. The, the partiality is incredible, there's nothing left in the end, it's just for all. <laughs> they read it. And actually, and, uh, interestingly uh, enough, the Egyptians used to do that as well. Uh, somewhere on the line with the scribes, they realized it's too much work to do all the hieroglyphs exactly. So they developed something they called common script or a vernacular that was really quick. And to read that one, uh, you need to, you, you will train your visual closure. Here is another one, visual processing, very important as well. And that is the process to see both externally and internally. Externally, for instance, a student must be able to process what is taught visually, while internally the student needs to be able to form clear and precise pictures of concepts. Because concepts, as we know, are actually pictures, something we learn from Lakoff and Johnson, which is fairly established today. People who are not good with concepts, differentiation, discrimination, those things we call like core intellectual skills, they are not good with visual processing. And that is also something that trained with making depictions of exterior things and doing those depictions at an exact manner. Then every time you do that, you train that. It's a bit similar to what uh, me and my dear colleague discussed about learning uh, text by heart, uh, for instance, from all Greek text. This, for instance, Kala learns by heart. This is actually training in visual processing because he remembers exactly how they were. And every time he repeats it exactly how it was, he trains that visual processing. And it is extremely important to write it down in the beginning. But after a while, listen here, this is a very good example. After a while, the person will be sufficiently skilled enough to know if they can repeat it in their mind exactly but without doing this for an extended period you don't know when you get it right and i think this for most westerners sounds like complete absurdity what is he talking about of course it's always exact when i remember something no it's not those areas are completely different you can have an exact memory of something but when you're processing it you can't see it exactly as it is it's exactly the same skill as is used to see the world around you. There's no difference there. For the brain, is no difference. These different subjects, things, history, language, it doesn't work with the brain. They're not good divisions. They are false. What we have instead, we have this visual processing. For instance. It's extraordinary. This is a core thing in intellectual thinking. If you don't develop it, you will not be able to intellectualize to any degree at all. So, uh, I don't think it's unfair to say that because of this uncalled for division, we think about the brain as the famous black box. Black box we have in airplanes where they crash. Nobody knows what's inside, just threw things at it randomly. Uh, like somebody throwing uh, pies on a clown or something like that. It's complete happenstance, there's no order to it. You don't teach the person, the student, the pupil, how they should receive it, what skills to differentiate between, all those things that has to do with the real brain, just because we used to have this horrible division. And that also affects the brain, so it's not only the mind. Here's another thing, uh, visual discrimination. And that's the ability to discern differences between objects, including size, shape, color, distance, 
and orientation of objects, how they turn around and all that, and the ability to discriminate items from the background. If you have a background like here, uh, especially on a painting, it's, it's easier to understand. I need to see this is separate from this. Otherwise, I can't see this is a vase with some flowers in it. It's actually wild rose flowers. I can see that even. Uh, that is extremely important when we come to abstract thinking. Maybe this is the very kernel of abstract thinking. Because you need to differentiate between different categories, different articles in what we call conceptualization. You need to differentiate uh, between group, singularity, smaller group, big group. Uh, you mean you need to understand uh, one good example, tonality in colors. You need to know that violet, uh, pink, uh, red, orange are part of red. And in the same, you need to understand that, for instance, the language is French. Spanish, Italian belongs to the Romans family and that the Romans family belongs to the larger group in the Euro European family. And that goes with all intellectual thinking bar none. Bar none. And that's actually visual thinking. That's your visual thinking that can do that. It's not by, done by itself. The black box doesn't hold. And here we see an incredible difference uh, depending how much you've been trained by this when you were young and how much you do it on a weekly basis. And good news, you can train it as an adult as well. Why? Because the brain's plasticity is enormous. And of course, this is what they do in the East. They don't have this, they told them to get rid of this. Uh, I, could give you, I could actually give you a good example. Uh, when we had uh, this uh, taking of the world from a Western perspective, colonialization, when different countries took different parts, especially Africa, they divided Africa usually in straight lines. Uh, and in the end, it was just a small part left. I think it was Liberia. Uh, they also went for Asia. And the French, they stranded in Indochina. And in Indochina, they discovered that, yeah, the Lao people, they were okay. They, they could keep their writing system. And the Khmer people, they were also okay. They can keep their writing system. Awfully complicated, unnecessary. Too many letters, the French thought. But we let them have it. But when it came to the Vietnamese people, they said, that's the limit. That's not French standardization. That's not the Paris liter or kilo or kilometer. We are going to take away the whole system. And they did. It was all thinking skills. It was nothing but thinking skills. It was an extensive system that led to a complete disaster in Vietnam. That disaster would have been worse than 10 nuclear bombs on Vietnam. And it was all caused by this. They were training all their intellectual skills. They were an advanced nation in Asia before. And everything was more or less demolished by this. And this is because of the black box idea. It was not, not caused by experience. It was not caused by science. They didn't have any scientific proof for that, the French. It was just this nonsensical thinking. Uh, unspoken assumption led to that disaster. Today, it's an incredible difference between Vietnam and China, just because of that. They used to be on equal basis. No longer they are, thanks to this devastating disaster. Because we think the brain is one whole thing. And the more we think that, the more we're going to turn into people who think uh, you can use your hands instead, instead of legs. People that actually exist. And mind you, they have problems with their wrists. Uh, that's a little bit unfair. Actually, they have uh, 
inherited problem with their backs. That's why they're walking on all fours, but mainly on their hands and elbows. But of course, it's not good for them. It's better if they stand up, even if they have a defect. And uh, there is at least 20 other skills that the brain need to separately train during the day or it's enough during the week. And uh, we already started with that process and it's mildly interesting because I actually lack one of those skills and that is uh, visual correctness, they call it. Visual correctness is that you visualize in your head something and that visualization is exactly as something you can perform with your hand. It's a bit opposite to this. This is you perform something with your hand and you can memorize it and later on you can check your memory because you trust your memory instinct because you trained it with your hand. This is the opposite. This is uh, having the image in your head and often a much more complicated image and then producing it. And this is what people usually call having an inner eye. But as you hear, it's much more complicated than that. Inner eye is to see things in front of you or inside your head uh, or above you, which is most common in China, actually, you see something above you. Uh, I'm trying to train that and uh, I manage to get colors. I can see different colors inside my head uh, and I manage to get shapes. And just to give you a clue how this training works, it's like uh, I started with a square and uh, the training was to keep the square like a square so it doesn't morph into triangle or it becomes blurred. You see, these are all different skills in a way. To keep something as it is for a while, but to stop it from becoming blurred. And to keep that vision clearer and clearer. And that is a specific skill. And that skill you can use later, for instance, dividing the body in obvious things. And I now I can see different colors on my body, thanks for that training. It took me like five, six months to at least have colors, but I don't have clear enough. Uh, I couldn't draw a person's face, for instance, from memory. Uh, I can draw. I do have the drawing skill, hmm. but I don't have the picture in my head. Whereas most people, they have the picture in their head, but they don't have the drawing skill. You see the difference? It's like, uh, well, it's very complicated this late in the afternoon. Uh, very interesting everything and good training color. Uh, it's really helpful and uh, once again it's our unassumed divisions that causes havoc. Trust all knowledge and trust also science. But don't trust this because it's coming from nowhere and it's worth less than putting money into a superiotic bank. Sorry for the comparison. All your superiotic people who are looking at this video. I say thank you very much and have a very pleasant afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.